President of Bihar and a farmer by occupation. Uh, she presented to the subject of OBD with the chief complaints of swelling in the neck for the last 15 years. She was apparently present 15 years back when she noticed a swelling in her neck which was insidious in onset, yeah. gradually progressive. Initially it was two to two centimeters in size which progressed to the head inside. Uh, there is no history of dyspnea, dyspagia, or stress of voice and syncope. No history suggestive of any hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism. There is uh, no history of uh, chest pain or hemoptysis. No pain in, no history of pain in abdomen. Any history of uh, no history of history of John, no history of jaundice. No history of lower back ache. Uh, no history of attack, loss of consciousness. No history of loss of appetite or significant pain loss. Uh, patient is a known case of hypothyroidism. For since past eight years, of which she is taking uh, a toxin tablet. Uh, patient is not suffering from any, any other comorbidities. She, is, she had undergone hysterectomy 23 years back. Uh, there is no family history of vital. The patient is in a mixed diet and uh, she has a history of consumption of brassica family, uh, cabbage, cabbage. There is no uh, bowel or bladder abnormalities. There is no history of smoking, tobacco, alcohol and any other addiction. Uh, she is having amenorrhea because of hysterectomy uh, coming to examination. Uh, uh, I, I examined my patient in a well lit room after taking proper informed consent. Uh, she was well oriented to die place in person. Uh, performance status was 90 according to uh, Parnoxy scale. BMI was 23. <coughs> and hydration status was adequate. Respiratory uh, was 18 per minute, regular in rhythm, thread or abdominal type. Pulse rate was 86 per minute, regular in rhythm, good in volume, normal in character. No radio radio delay, no radio femoral delay. Blood pressure was 120 by 80. There is no evidence of pallor, ictus, burping, cyanosis, edema, and generalized lymph node Now, the examination of swelling. On inspection, the swelling is present in front and side of the neck and thyroid region. The swelling is nodular in shape and move up and down in the deep region. Right lobe is approximately 6 into 6 cm, and left lobe is 4 into 3 cm. Swelling in the middle line is approximately 3 to 3 cm. The swelling is not a surface. Margins are clearly defined. Skin of the swelling has no scar or pigmentation. No pulsation was present over the swelling. Uh, on examination of retrosolar extension, inferior extent of the swelling is not visible even on degradation. Dilated veins are present on the right, on the neck and upper part of the chest, with the button sign positive. You can see prominent veins over the neck and upper part of the chest and this is from burden sign positive. On palpation there was no tenderness, local rise of temperature, swelling is dominated and firm in consistency throughout. Right lobe extends above up to thyroid cartilage and below to caracals and laterally up to the posterior border of right sternum Left lobe extends up to the thyroid cartilage below up to the 2, two cm above the clavicle and laterally up to anterior border of left sternum Midline swelling extends inferiorly underneath manubrium and 3 cm above suprasternal lot superiorly. Circumference of neck at most prominent part of swelling is 40 cm. It is mobile in both vertical and horizontal direction, no fixity to skin, right curved pulse shifted posterior lateral by the swelling, trachea cannot be palpated due to swelling, caucus test was negative, there was no pulsation thrill over the swelling. On lymph node function, no cervical lymph node was palpable. Uh, no audible brewery or over swelling was auscultated. Summary A 46 year old lady with swelling in the thyroid region from last 15 years, <coughs> swelling is increasing in size very slowly since then and in overall growth front and side of the neck with no history of rapid increase in size of swelling. There is no history of pain, her appetite, uh, no history of pain, loss of appetite, bowel and bladder are normal with no signs of toxicity or deficiency of th thyroid hormones. No other in family has similar swelling in the neck. On examination, journal survey was essentially no, essentially normal. Nodal swelling is present in the front and side of neck, which moves up and down with deglutition. Swelling is firm in consistency throughout and not tender. Carotid pulses is posterior lateral and trachea is not palpable. Swelling extends retrosternal. No signs of pressure effects on or toxic symptoms. Survival lymph node not present, not palpable. Diagnosis. 46 year old lady with multi swelling in thyroid, clinically used for red, probably benign with retrosternal extension. You heard the history and examination. Any questions? 
before I start. So, so we're recording this. Ro Rohil has told me to record. Okay. okay. Uh, anybody? Any questions? Any questions from what they spoke? Anything that you observed which was different from what you would think it should be? Okay, so we'll go back. Well, history. 46 year lady with uh, resident resident of Bihar, which is important here because there are certain belts where there is iron deficiency, so it makes sense. Just close that door, please. Yeah. And she's a farm. She presented with swelling in the neck. When you say swelling in the neck, can you sit in the front, please? Hello. Sit here. Don't go far. No point going to climb that far. First of all, when you talk about a swelling which is thyroid, there's no point beating around the bush constantly in the neck, around the neck or in front of the neck. Because the neck also you've got to def define where it is, you've got to describe where it is. So front of the neck is fine, otherwise neck is backside also. So one won't get an idea. That's, that's one change I would want here. And it presents since 15 years, which is a long time. She was apparently well 15 years ago when she noticed a swelling in her neck again. Because one would keep thinking there is a swelling. So swelling in front of the neck will make it more direct. Because you are talking about uh, the region that you are interested in. So that's why. Gradually progressive, insidious onset. Initially 2 by 2 centimeters has grown progress to the current size. That's fine. There's no history of dystria and dysphagia hosted in the voice syncope. Obviously, they have a few things in mind. Why history of syncope? One is carotid effects. The other thing is, what could be the logic for syncope? Why syncope? Somebody here? Syncope. Masandra. One is carotid, of course. You will have, you know, uh, the, the reasons could be related to carotid sinus, but also toxic patients. That's what, what? That's what I'm saying. Toxic patients with CNS abnormality. Syncope is one of the presentations. Similarly, when you look at the metastatic history that they've taken, last time we had corrected it. You would say there is no history suggestive of metastasis like bone pains, convergence, headaches, etc. Rather than writing the whole laundry list, you can just talk about. And then being the metastatic components. So that, that part is taken care of. No history suggestive of hyper or hypothyroidism. Now that's a good point. And the moment you say there is no history suggestive of hyper or hypothyroidism, you will be asked the question, what are those features? So what are the features of hyperthyroidism? They can be gastrointestinal features, which includes uh, uh, diarrhea. So, uh, they can be serious symptoms. So, uh, if you keep recording this, there is no entry suggestive or hypothyroidism, that's all. If nobody spoke, you did not record, if you are recording. So, um, so you both are in field. What did he say? Would you like to add something to that? Um. You would like want to add something to that? Sorry. Well, so what is the problem? He was not able to classify them. So he was not able to put them in the right basket, each one. So there will be neurological symptoms and there will be cardiological symptoms. So symptoms related to neurological system and CVS. Correct? Now related to the now. Neurological would be anxiety, insomnia, lack of uh, you know self-belief, excitability, tremors, drop attacks, insomnia. Excessive sweating, it will all happen. And anxiety also can be precipitated. That is why they look at anxiety as something which is coexisting along with thyroidoxicosis. And what would be the features of hypothyroidism? Yes, hypo, you, 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 yes. If you're clever, just the opposite of what you've already said. Try to sit in front, it will be better, take less time to reach. 
Yes? Sluggishness, lethargy, weight gain, excessive sleep. Cold intolerance. In a classical scenario, they ask you when you go for exams. A lady is talking on phone to her doctor and she passes off. She sleeps. What is the disease in mind? You're thinking of myxedema, hypothyroidism. Okay? Change in voice. What happens to the voice? Hoarseness. This is not related to the hoarseness of the. The recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. It's just that there is edema. 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 That's right. So it will have. It will be kind of uh, not a not a very. Uh, it's a low pitch, broad based kind of a speech. So there's no timber in it. Timber in a speech is very important. With that sharpness that comes through will be missing. And one is too lethargy. It's exactly the sleep you have when you wake up from a very very <coughs> deep sleep. Generally, when somebody wakes you up from that sleep, so then you start talking in. You know, in a strange voice, and that's exactly what happens to these patients and they continue to happen. And ladies, what would be the important ones? Important symptoms would be related to menstruation. And what are those symptoms? Uh. Menorrhagia in hypothyroidism. Now, and polymenorrhea in thyrotoxicosis. So when you talk about it, there are few symptoms which are common. You can get menorrhagia and thyrotoxicosis also later. But by and large, Hypo or oligo menorrhea and menorrhagia in hypothyroidism. So that becomes important. So it's good to write no history suggestive of hyper or hypothyroidism. Similarly, no history suggestive of metastasis. Leave that statement for the examiner to ask you a question. So with each statement that you make, the trick of or the art of examination is you leave a question for the examiner to ask you. Preferably the one that you can answer. You don't leave trouble there. So then you'll be asked a question that you can't answer. So what you're sure of metastatic history? So what do you do? You you, you suggest no history of no history suggestive of metastasis. What would be that history? Okay? Not much in high, right? Very simple. When you're whenever you're in doubt or you're confused, just go back to the old Two L's and two B's. Two B's and two L's. That's it, not related to that. That's not rocket science now. So two B's and two L's. Somebody's asking. Let me go. So no history of headaches, convulsions, giddiness. Giddiness, convulsions. No history of, you would say jaundice, but that doesn't happen. By and large, thyroid malignancies and also head and neck malignancies don't go places. They remain confined and there are reasons for that we'll discuss as we go along. That is, that is a smart way to describe our history of our history. There are a couple of points which I think I'll find now. Now there is no history suggestive of metastasis. He's already written, but then he has repeated the whole thing. There's no harm in repeating it. Provided you can write, there is no history suggestive of metastasis like cuff, chest pain, hemoptysis, abdominal pain, etc. etc. rather making a long laundry list as I say. So, no history suggestive of metastasis is a very useful statement. No history suggestive of hypohypothyroidism is a very useful statement. Why? Because with that statement you can quickly cover the whole spectrum. And importantly, the examination is about talking. If you talk 70% times, you have won. If the examiner talks 70% times, you have lost. If it is 50-50, you are 50-50. It's as simple as that. So, we move on to the... This is well taken. There is nothing wrong with the history. Past history. Patient is a known case of hypothyroidism. It's very important. Now, if the patient is a known case of hypothyroidism, then he still has a case of hypothyroidism. It's wrongly written. Glad you admit that. So, what would be the correction? Patient is a known case of. I have no problem with that. Don't worry. Patient is a known case of diabetes, hypothyroidism, or whatever. That doesn't become a past history. Past history is about something that past is to end. Hmm. And this is not ending. So, past history cannot be something which is continuing. So, patient is a known case of hypothyroidism. It's useful. 
the patient is not suffering from any other comorbidities and there are no comorbidities <coughs> that's simple <coughs> because you can only suffer from comorbidities so you don't have to mention not suffering no comorbidities she had another one hysterectomy 23 years ago in a tertiary care hospital in the west why is this important here you're taking history of previous surgery. How would hysterectomy be relevant? You, you, you're right. Huh? Now you can explain amenorrhea due to this. Good. And you won't link it to the thyroidoxicosis. So at least one confusion is gone. How old is she? So this is an age no medical matter, so that's fine. Would you like to know why was the hysterectomy done? Would you be interested in if you are in a good place where you could retrieve the records? You would like to know. Yes. I would like to just get it from all of you. What? 20 years back you were fit. Even you were fit. Now, how is it relevant? It is relevant. Yes, there could be an ovarian malignancy. You try malignancy, Bhavishi. She had never surgery. 23 years ago, that's what done. 23 years ago, she was obviously fit. Now that fitness thing would work and actually fitness has nothing to do with the previous surgery. You would have operated on an unfit patient for an emergency. That's, that is not a reference point. So we would like to know whether there was a surgery done for any cancer. Which cancers are more, more of concern to you? Don't be, you are sitting in the first row, there is no problem, don't worry. If you can answer it's fine. Then we move on to, she's on 100 microgram per day. A common mistake is milligram, people say, it's microgram. She's taking 100, which means she's still hypothyroid. Which means she is a case of hypothyroid. Which means it will appear in your diagnosis also. Now you see the series of mistakes that will happen with one. So it will happen that she is a known case of hypothyroidism who has got a multinodular goiter, the whole story changes. And you mentioned there is no history suggestive of hypo or hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't want to make you feel silly because I don't need to. <laughs> it is very obvious. That you, it is a case of hypothyroidism. You don't have to declare anything. She can't be hyper then. She's one of the two. But don't worry. How did it slip out of your mind? I'll tell you. You were focused on something else in the beginning and you found out about it uh, at the end. And then, very common mistake. We did a supplementary exam yesterday. I was doing it in my ward. And two or three good students also unfortunately had to appear. They failed because of the theory. We had passed them in practical. Then they were not bad students. I was feeling bad for them. Let me tell you, one failure is a bad spot. You feel very miserable all your life. You say, why did I? They're good students. Same mistake happened. I said, I passed you last time in practicals on the same mistake. Unfortunately, my memory is sharp, so I remember you. You've done the same mistake this time. That means you didn't learn. It's not enough to be a good student. It's more important to be a good learner and learn from others' mistakes. Your life is too short to learn only from your own mistakes. You won't live that long. So learn who did it, so I won't do it. I'll tell you the basic mistake. Never combine the two. When you're examining the patient, don't ask questions. Everybody does it. If you're already examining the abdomen, suddenly you remember to ask. Okay, okay. Did you have? Uh, did you take any uh, hormone replacement therapy? The case the malignancy. You should have asked and finished with it. Okay, you have forgotten a few points, finish examination and then go back. A classical situation, you are doing DRE and suddenly you remember, this is a case of malignancy of the bladder or prostate or this patient has also got features of oral cancer. Do you smoke? What a time to be asking a question. <laughs> the patient in that position can easily ask you, can you see the smoke coming out? <laughs> 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 already know the patient is hypothyroid. If the patient is a hypothyroid, you can't say this. No history suggestive of hypo-hypothyroidism. 
And you must be wondering, just a half a minute, a minute back, I was appreciating this statement and now I'm ridiculing it. It was important. So that you understand. Nobody is ridiculed here. You learn out of it quickly. Don't make statements which are not correct. Past history is past history. And similarly, the patient is already a hypothyroid. Okay? And we move on quickly. This is fine. Family history. No history of goiter in family. I'm not interested in goiter. What am I interested in? Why do you spend probably here? Although you got it. <coughs> well, if you look at it from the point of view of a thyroid patient, what family history would you like to have? Sir, autoimmune disorders, uh, like grades, there's an autoimmune, so in that Any autoimmune disorder of the thyroid gland, but that gets covered in water. Anything else? Louder. No, which one? M E N. Brilliant. Give a big round of applause. Any end syndrome would mean you are an intelligent, good student who deserves to be treated separately. <laughs> now, the moment you say any end, you would have declared that don't talk to me nonsense, I am a good student. And the examiner would say, what is any end naturally? And I'm saying the same thing. What is any end? Dives. Dives. One, two, eight, two, B. Now, naturally, it has cancers like medullary, parathyroid hemiplasia. It has neurofibromatosis. All that history becomes family. <coughs> so, how would you write all that list here? No, no history. How would I change it? There is no family history suggestive of any cancer or disease related to any history. Like in breast, I taught you, no history related to BRCA1, BRCA2 disease. Uh, genes. What does that mean? The examiner says, okay, another different student. What is BRCA1? What is BRCA2? You've taken your three minutes, four minutes, and you're scoring. That's exactly the art of examination. <coughs> examination means utter the best things in that little time. So that you have many good things, and that's your marking. That's how you're marked. That's about the history, family history. So I will be more interested in any and related family history. Rest won't matter. Personal history is perfectly fine. She brought out the issues of there's no history of smoking, dash tobacco, chewing. Why did you take history of smoking, Amit? You don't know why you took it. You did it together, no? Anjali? Smoking. Anybody? Carcinogen. When you don't know, there is a beautiful answer that you can always give. And it will save you from a lot of embarrassment and trouble. And that is, I don't know. <laughs> because you give a wild answer, which will be a problem. So then you will be asked that question. So don't do that. If you don't know, say you don't know. It's simple. He didn't say anything. It's good. You don't have anything to do with thyroid cancer. We don't know. There is no connection between thyroid cancer and smoking. All the smoking does nothing good. We know that. But generally speaking, how would it be useful? You would find out about the comorbidities like chest related problems, NSCC related risks and the most important thing that tobacco does is poor healing. <coughs> most people forget it. You suddenly get hooked on to lung cancer, oral cancer, those things happen. But an average smoker heals poorly. Even if you are doing a hernia surgery, don't say Honey, a patient when you talk about smoking, you talk about cough all the time. It's not cough one alone. It's the collagen-related issues, elastin deficiency. So they don't heal well. So you have to stop smoking. If this patient was for surgery, you have to stop smoking. That's why you need to find out. So it's not always related to the same thing. Use your, I mean, usual understanding of tobacco-related cancers. Now, we, we have certain cancers in thyroid which are familial. And what is the difference between familial and uh, the genetic? Hereditary good. So the broader term is familial. And when you know the gene, it is hereditary. So breast cancer is familial. And there is a term called 
hereditary breast cancer, where you have BRCA1, BRCA2, etc. In thyroid again, for medullary cancer of thyroid we have, what is the gene? Men to Men. Red. 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 RET, proto oncogene. It's a complete term. Proto oncogene is a type of oncogene. The other one is BRAF for papillary cancer, papillary thyroid cancer, which you should know. And you can write in your exam and highlight it. You'll get marks for that. The family history becomes important there. I just remembered. So tobacco becomes important. I'm rushing through. Now the menstrual history, he summed up quickly, which I didn't like. You should be more clear. Here, menstrual history becomes important. You already know why. I don't need to get into that. Minaki, 12 years. How are the cycles? Now she's having a memory due to his track. He summed it up there. But he, he would, in a normal person, would like to elaborate on it. The menstrual history in these patients. Elsewhere, it may not be so important. In breast cancer, it's important. In thyroid cancer, it's important. So you highlight that. But here, it's okay. Because she underwent hysterectomy, so that takes care of it. Now coming to the examination, that's about history. And history was good. It's just that few things were extra, few things, because they were extra, they were wrong. So we corrected them. Journal physical examination, everything very nicely brought out. Examined in well lit room, but one thing was missed. When you examine thyroid admission, you always mention, like in breast, I have emphasized on sitting, reclining, supine position in thyroid. I would always say this, I examined the patient in good daylight. You don't get good daylight these days. So you say, well, they do. Good daylight is written in your Hutchison. But then no, you won't take the patients out now. So what should you do? Well, lit room, after taking informed consent, sitting position and me sitting at the same level. The moment you say that, the, the same thing happens to the examiner. This, this person knows. And why should you examine thyroid in a sitting position? Because Many of the thyroid swellings can be missed if you look at, at an angle. And if you want to do even better for head and neck cancers, thyroid swellings, parotid, everything, you would say, I examined the patient first from a distance, then from close. It's akin to looking at the mountains. If you want to see the details, you have a panoramic view. If you get too close for comfort, all you see is a circle of rock. So just be broadly saying it. I examined a patient in good, in a well-lit room after taking informed consent in a sitting position with me sitting at the same level. First from a distance, then from close. You said it in a breath. Practice it. Don't take ages to say that and then it's a problem. Because you take too long to say something which is very, very simple. Yeah? Now, uh, when you get found to uh, the examination part from a distance and from close, few swellings which are not visible when you are close will be visible now. And you can make out from the inspection, well, this is journal examination of the thyroid, as we go to thyroid, we discuss it. Without fail, start with performance status like they did, nutritional status like they did, but here, here's written, but it didn't speak. Performance status is 90 on the Nofsky scale, which is perfect. Nutritionally preserved on account of BMI being 23. And there is no clinical evidence of any deficiency of vitamins or micronutrients. There are two macro and micronutrients. No? And hydration status is good. <coughs> Respiration, pulse rate. <coughs> pulse rate is important here. Mm -hmm. And here you will expand on pulse, which they have done. Very well done. Regular, good in volume, normal in character, no radio, 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 femoral delay. Peripheral pulses were all felt. What happens to the pulses in thyroidoxicosis? Uh, Excellent, very well answered. He started by saying it's a high cardiac output state. So my, my many questions are answered there. And I know the student knows what he's saying. So what would that do to the pulse volume? And in thyroidoxicosis you can even get water have a pulse. Because the volume is a high cardiac output state. Uh, else, otherwise you get it in aortic regurgitation and anemia for the same reason. Reason is the same, water level cause. And the, what happens to the rhythm in atrial fibrillation? The rhythm is? Irregularly irregular. Irregularly irregular. 
ventricular fibrillation? Regularly, regular. No pulses are regular. Atrial fibrillation regularly, regular. And ventricular fibrillation? No pulses are There is no pulse. Good. Big round of applause for him. Often we say, irregularly, regular, and it will be reduced ventricular fibrillation, the heart is, you understand the meaning of fibrillation, it's just shaking. The ventricle is just fibrillating, it's not getting filled, so it can't push. Which is more important, diastole or systole? Diastole. How many for diastole? Raise your hands properly. There's six of them. How many for systole? Same six. What is the problem? How are the others? Others don't know. Diastole is important or systole is important? Diastole is important. Why? Because it supplies blood to the heart itself in that period. That's good. Why? Because sir, uh, when uh, the heart uh, is in diastole, it's relaxed and the vessels are open. So the blood supply, coronary vessels are open, so the blood supply goes to the heart itself. Any other reason? Why heart has to supply itself in diastole only? Actually, it cannot supply itself in systole. One answer is this. Second. Because the coronary vessels contract because of the muscular. Is it because of this that diastole is more important? I mean, I was asking, I've been taken to another question which I'll ask you. Said to pump blood in. So. So to pump blood and systole, it needs to fill up. Well, 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 well. You've been taught in physiology, Starling's law. Mm -hmm. You have to stretch the band for it to close. So it has to fill before it can contract. That's the deal. So diastole leads to systole. It's simple. And it's not complicated. And if you want to talk about the second part, why is um, diastole important? One reason she gave, which is, which is brilliant, that heart supplies itself during diastole. For one reason, for one reason that she gave, coronaries are relaxed because mm. during contraction they will be contracted. That means during systole there is no blood supply to the heart. That's not correct. There is limited blood supply. Mm. But the more important reason, please watch it carefully, the aortic cusp mm. is a cup. Cusp mm. is a Greek word for cup. I think I'm sure it was cusp. S went away and then it became cup, right? So it is a cup like a door. This door is a cup, imagine. And at the top of it are the openings through which the coronaries are coming. You know that? Yes. Aortic cusps. So when it closes, the blood fills, it spills. Hmm. So it will, the, the coronaries will get blood supply only when the cusp is down. You get my point? So it's only during diastole that it will happen. Because during diastole, the aortic cusp is closed. So aorta is filled full of blood and blood goes. Basically, therefore, coronaries are not supplied by heart. They are supplied by aorta. That's, that's a separate uh, thing in <laughs> physiology and anatomy, but I took you there. So diastolic pressure is more important than systolic, and pulse pressure is the best assessment of this. Moving on, so there's no evidence of violent sinusoidal edema, and a lot of people call it pickle. We don't use that, but I think I told you in Ames, every student was saying pickle is normal. <laughs> this pickle is a wrong statement. You should not use that. Now the swelling. We do not say examination of the swelling. I have been harping on this for a very long time. It should have an examination of the neck. Because you have examined the rest of the neck, so you can't say I examined just the swelling. Examination of breast, examination of abdomen, examination of chest, examination of neck. Now what do we examine in the neck? There is a swelling in front of the side of the thigh, etc. etc. Here you would say, I examined the patient in a sitting position with me in front. I inspected the, the neck from front and I palpated from behind. Because except for trachea, the whole palpation in neck would happen from behind. behind. Why do we need to flex the yeah. So inspection from front and palpation from behind. And you can say that. Yeah. Now when you are inspecting, so the swelling is nodular. There is no swelling which is nodular. It's the surface which is. The swelling is present in front and side of the neck and thyroid. This is a wrong statement. You would straight away say there is a swelling present in the thyroid fossa. 
like for parotid I taught, taught you, swelling in the parotid region. The moment you say there is swelling in the thyroid fossa, you ask the question, what are the boundaries of thyroid fossa? And what are the boundaries I see? No? 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 <coughs> Nobody? Somebody here? Guess? What can be the boundary? Let's, let me change the question. What can be the boundaries of thyroid for some? One minute. Sternocleidomastoid laterally on both sides. The medial border of sternomastoid on both sides, correct? Above, uh, High bone, below suprasternal notch, is there a prophet sign? Any swelling lying in thyroid fossa is a thyroid swelling unless Kuhun has opened. Any swelling lying in parotid region is a parotid swelling unless proven otherwise. And if the swelling moves on deglutition, it has to be thyroid swelling. But when I am saying this, I will also tell you there are swellings which move on deglutition and they are not thyroid. But by and large they are thyroid. So, I am talking about this fossa, where sternocleidomastoid is <coughs> the side, high bone and suprasternal notch, this is the thyroid fossa. If you know the boundaries of thyroid fossa, it becomes very simple to describe your case because what he has done is swelling is present in front and side of the neck. There is nothing like front and side in neck. You have triangles in neck. And our technical description is anterior triangle, posterior triangle. Right? So you can't use the term front and side. And it is moving on deglutition. Now there is nothing, repeat, there is nothing that moves down on deglutition. <coughs> close the door. So you come in, close the door. <laughs> now, there is nothing that moves down on deglutition except food. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you say the swelling moves up on deglutition, naturally, why should the swelling move down on deglutition? And why does it move up on deglutition? I'm, I'm sorry. Why does it move on deglutition? It has to be up. Anybody? Pretracheal fascia. Well, it is. What are the fascia in the neck? Pretracheal fascia. The fascia modifies into pretracheal and pretracheal fascia, which covers the thyroid gland, forms pseudo capsule, which is known as. That's not correct. It's wrong. The fascia. The deep fascia in the neck divides into investing and a pretracheal layer. That's first of all, that should be clear. And why is investing layer called investing layer? It will invest the sternomastoid, keratids, strap muscles, and join in the midline, do the same thing on the other side, and become the prevertebral fascia in the posterior triangle. That's the story of the deep cervical fascia, investing layer. And thyroid is deeply investing layer of deep fascia naturally. So you, therefore that statement, not fixed to skin is absurd. If it is moving on deglutition, it has no business to be attached to skin, unless it has gone through the skin. Clear? And if it is attached to skin, it can't move up on deglutition. Can't. The next thing, once you say pre I mean the investing layer I've finished, pre tracheal fascia invests the thyroid gland all around. And in the top portion, it's almost like there is nothing below, so it is holding the gland on like an envelope. And above this envelope is closed, sealed. And when it is sealed, when you seal an envelope, it becomes a flat surface. That is the pretracheal fascia condensation, which is called Berry's ligament. Okay. It is not just one, <coughs> one strand, it is a strap which is attached to the larynx and therefore it moves on deglutition. Let us keep it there. And there is the role of the transmitter, which when you are swallowing, the whole Laryngopharyngeal complex is made into moving up. Understand that swelling in the midline is this is not the correct statement. There is a visible swelling in thyroid fossa, which is of the size uh, I can measure. It's about six to seven centimeters. I can now I'm telling you what I would do if I was to answer this. 
The skin over the swelling appears normal, however there are dilated veins. I cannot see it, I cannot find the lower border on inspection. I can see the trachea above. You can't say trachea is not palpable, that's the wrong statement. The trachea is not palpable, but thyroid notches, I'll go here. And if trachea is deviated, notch will also be deviated. So by feeling for the notch, you can complete the trail sign. What is trail sign? So it's an expectory finding. You examine the neck from the front and the prominent, more prominent sternomastoid is the side towards which trachea is moved. Then you confirm it on palpation by putting a finger on the uh, Come here, sir. You don't mind. Now, extend your neck. So I am looking, both sides of my stretch are normal. You can see them. Now, <laughs> I'll put my fingers on the, clav uh, on the clav clavicle and I'll feel for the thyroid notch here, which is simple. And I'll trace it down, and then go on either side to look that the distance is the same. Thank you. Now, that would be completion of trails. So most people stop at that because you can have, you know, an artifact patient is going to fly neck or torticollis or something. So what you should do is feel on either side the distance. Is that clear? That's look for trachea. It's important for us. Trachea is important. Dilated neck waves is important. They're important because if there's a reference on extension, there would be dilated veins on the chest wall. Why are there dilated veins on the chest wall? As a part of Superior vena cava syndrome. You're pressing on the thoracic inlet, not outlet. Inlet is compressed. That leads to dilatation of the veins. <laughs> the swelling has nodular surface. This is better. March is a well defined skin of the swelling. No scar pigmentation, no pulsation. So, I, how would I describe it? I was telling you. With the visible swelling of the size 7 to 4 cm, 6 cm in front of the in the thyroid fossa, where I can see the uh, the swelling is more on the right side than on the left side. Trachea is visible, it's in the center. However, I can't see the lower part of trachea, thyroid notch is visible. Dilated veins are present, no scar sinuses sign of history. On palpation, the local temperature is not raised, it's non tender, trachea is central, trail sign is uh, positive for being central. Swelling is firm and consistency, moves on deglutition, I cannot get below the swelling. On either side, I can palpate the swelling, surface is not low. I am just saying what you have written. And then, when you are talking about carotid pulsations, the swelling has not your surface margin of effects skin over the swelling, no pulsations over the swelling. Why should there be pulsations over the swelling? No reason. Don't even mention it. Okay? Don't add this to carotid body tumor. It's a big gland. It doesn't make sense. Under the swelling is lateral. It's lying in the region where you can have something sitting on a carotid vessel. Upper part of the chest with Pemberton sign positive. How did you do the Pemberton sign? I asked the patient to raise, I asked the patient to raise both her hands above the head, uh, touching the ears, and I looked for the prom prominence of vein and congestion over her face. First of all, it's not hands. Arms. It's arms. arms. <coughs> hands are just knees. <coughs> that would mean this. Which it is not. So, the first is uh, you make the patient understand that you will be sitting and I will be observing you from front. Arm by the side, touching the, uh, the ears. And the, there will be prominent neck veins, face may have flush. And actually, when a dark patient is you, you, in a patient like this, you cannot see it very clearly. They don't look congested easily. So in a dark patient, you can look for the conjunctival condition. That's one button sign. The other sign is written is caucus is negative. What is caucus sign? Last row. Caucus test. Caucus test. I am not asking for any specific reason. I am starting from the last row so that I would find out somewhere. Caucus. Caucus, caucus, caucus. You have not come there. Are you sure? Caucus stage, you have come. Yes. Was it narrowed 
Kafka stress, first of all, understand, is done to find out if there is a tracheal compression by the gland. And you can find it out only if you do the test the correct way. Otherwise, that strider can be produced in everybody. So do not compress the lobes on both the sides. You follow me? Generally, Cogger's test is only done if the gland is enlarged on both sides. You don't do it on unilateral goiter. So if the trachea is shifted, it may not be important. But if you need gland on both sides. One. Number two, you put your hands on the lateral limit of the gland on either side. But don't press both. Only one hand is pressed. So there's an active hand and there's a passive hand. And patient has strider. It is called positive caucus test. Caucus test is done to find out the pressure on the trachea. But I have heard this answer very commonly that you press it from both sides. If the trachea is compressed, then if you press from both sides, every trachea will be compressed. So that test would not be valid. And you will actually put it stride in. You can put it stride in a normal person without, without a white term. But then you need to put one hand into action. Other hand should be waiting. So that's Cochrane's test. Margin of clarity defined, no pulsations, dilated weights, so many things are extra. You don't have to mention specifically that retrosternal extension I tested like this. What would you say? I did Pemberton's test because I could not get below the swelling. You don't do it in a patient where you can get below the swelling. Because if you don't get below the swelling, you have a doubt. What should be the clinical features of a patient with retrosternal extension of goiter? Somebody here. Dullness who say. Percussion where? Uh, on the sternum. Uh, Manubri. Put your finger on the sternum. Or you come here. No problem. No, this is the test given in your book. It's not wrong. I'm just showing you. I'm showing you something that is important for you. Sorry, if you don't mind. Now that sternum. Done? The two sternal extension of the Sorry. I'm proving a point to you so that you don't ape something which is not correct. This is done. Because it's always done. So this test is useless. It's given in your book. So how do you call it useless for the exam? So I couldn't appreciate it, so that's it. <laughs> it's a polite way of saying you're wasting your time and mine too. I have more important things to do. Retrosternal extension of percussion of a hernia. I heard bobble and momentum. Naturally, that boy has never come to the clinics. You cannot percuss anything unless it is steady. So the, you can't percuss hernia. It's ridiculous. It's given in your book. So you would percuss a hernia for God's sake. How can you? You will percuss, it will go away. It can't be percussed. All right. Suppose you manage to percuss it. It will always be dull. So don't even mention that test. What would you say there is no How do you look for retrosternal extension therefore? If I can't get below the swelling, I will do the Pemberton sign. Pemberton positive, I take it as extended unless proven otherwise. And nobody operates a patient based on your clinical examination. We investigate. And this is an indication of CT for us. Only time you see that. So percussion of a sternum is a waste of an effort. Similarly, somebody asked me in breast, internal memory group of lymph nodes, percussing the intercostal spaces, you will never get it. Inter in the, the internal memory nodes cannot be clinically assessed. It's wrong. So just understand, and I showed you what I'm saying. You're getting my point? It is always with evidence that you should take things and understand. But except God, everybody has to give evidence. <coughs> You don't say, I feel that way, therefore, I have done it and it works or doesn't, no, I, it doesn't exist. It is evidence. So we will look for retrosternal extension by first palpating and then by temperature. And temperature sign is very rightly mentioned, arms up by the side of the ear, 
look for congestion of the face, mainly because wh wh what is happening is the inlet is getting blocked. blocked. So this patient can give you a history of orthopnea if there is massive compression. When he, she lies down or he lies down, there will be orthopnea. The patient will give you, therefore, when you are examining a thyroid swelling, especially in a male patient, expose the entire chest. If you see dilated veins on the chest, it's not just the neck. Dilated veins on the chest would indicate superior vena cable pressure. And that's a very important finding for a retrosternal extension. Sometimes you have a separate gland in the neck and a retrosternal inflow. So therefore, it's an important feature. Look for those dilated veins. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Clear to you? So that compression doesn't work. You do not want the pemberton side. Now, moving on. See, the pemberton is very nicely done here. There's nothing wrong with what they did. I'm just correcting there. They already got about 55, 60% marks in this, the way they present. But that's not too good. You should be doing even better. They are dilated veins. And if you had taken the eyes into consideration, they would have been a much better picture to show. That's the important sign. And actually, there is nothing like it. it's a, not a part of pal inspection. You inspect, palpate, and auscultate, no percussion here. And Pemberton is a separate test. So you do that as a separate test. Caucus test, separate test. I have no problem if you put it this way. But it's not a part of inspection. Swelling is lobulated and firm in consistency throughout. Right lobe extends above the thyroid cartilage below the clavicle. Wonderfully taken. Left lobe perfect, perfect, perfect. No problem there. Mobility. Sometimes when you're moving it, you're moving it along with the trachea. Everything moves. Fix the trachea and then move it. So vis-a-vis -vis trachea mobility is okay. You get my point? Sometimes the lungs is mobile in breast, but actually the breast is mobile. So therefore there is something called as intrinsic mobility. What do you do there? You stabilize, fix the breast and then try to move the lump. And you find that it's getting stuck somewhere. It's important. If you're moving it along with trachea, anything can move. So that mobility is important. Otherwise the swelling is moving on deglutition, so it's naturally moving up. In which case, will a thyroid swelling not move on deglutition? <laughs> Beyond second time, you'll have to answer. Anybody? Anaplastic arsuma is correct. Give a big round of applause. Why doesn't why does it move on deglutition in anaplastic? You would say, well, when, when would it stop? It just goes on and on. Yes. What is the reason? So due to the... Um, so fibroblastic response that is adhered to the... Excellent! Big, big, big round of applause. <laughs> Not fibroblastic, it's desmoplastic. Desmoplastic. Desmoplastic means to get fixed to surrounding structures can't move. What are the other swelling that move on deglutition? Pre-tracheal lymphonitis, cyst, and sub-hyperscitis. When you were examining for the carotids, you mentioned somewhere, carotid is displaced. Both sides? Right side. So you mentioned both sides, that's the problem. It's only on the right side. What is Bailey's sign? Absence so of carotid. Absence of carotid. When there is absence of carotid pulsation, you do encroachment of... Either it is engulfed, encroached, or infiltrated. So with carotid pulsation, you cannot appreciate. It is Bailey's sign. What is where is where do you feel for the carotids? It's the anterior border of the uh, sternocleidal mastoid. Uh, we press against the uh, with the thumb. We press against the thyroid cartilage. Then the move the yes. The move so we against See, first of all, whenever you are asked a question, how do you where do you feel for a pulse? Don't say I mean radial pulse. Where do you feel? You would say I feel it with three fingers in a semi-prone position of my forearm, which is correct, against styloid proximal radius. A pulse is always felt against a bone. So it's a level at the level of thyroid cartilage is correct, medial sternomastoid is correct, but against shy shagnex tubercle or carotid tubercle, which is on C6 transverse proximal, you were saying C5, that's why I put it. 
shy, shag necks, call it shag necks, that is also fine. But carotid tubercle is also fine. And we do not palpate for both pulses simultaneously. Why? Unconscious. Patient will be unconscious. Why? Because supply to the brain would be stopped. How many for that? Yeah, you can raise it. You for that? Supply to the brain is stopped. She said that. So, how many for compromise? The compromise looks like a better option, so everybody puts up. But that's wrong. Even the compromise is wrong. It has nothing to do with blood supply to the brain. You all read it in your neurology. It's vertebral, vascular system, and circular villus, you know. It doesn't have just the carotids. So you wouldn't die of it. It is the baroreceptors in the carotid bulb. <coughs> For all those who come to the theater once in a while, they must have seen when I'm doing dissection close to the carotid bifurcation. I shout to the anesthetist, I'm at the bifurcation. Because handling at the bifurcation can lead to bradycardia due to baroreceptors getting stimulated. <coughs> even day even before yesterday, some, team, some students were there. And I showed them that you see the pulse rate would drop as I get close to the carotid bulb. And the anesthetist may, may not wake up, I'll have to tell him. I said, look at the screen. He said, no, sir, it's fine, absolutely fine. I said, I've not done anything so far. So when I did the dissection at the bulb, it got down to 60. And that is when you need to infiltrate around the carotid bulb to block the receptor. So don't do bilateral examination of carotids at the same time because pressure on carotid bulb will lead to bradycardia. You don't cut off the blood supply to the brain. You just can't. <laughs> Okay, now uh, coming to the circumference of the neck, it's very nicely taken, although it doesn't change anything. Mobile in horizontal vertical direction, no fixing now. So this is a statement which is not right. It's got no business to be there. No fixity to skin. After all this. You can't be saying it is fixed to skin because that's the last thing it will reach. And thyroid swelling, often a question is asked to all students, what is the plane of a thyroid swelling? Your answer is deep to deep fascia, which means deep to investing layer of deep fascia, which means very deep. So it can't get fixed to skin. Let this go. That's a crucial fascia. Brachia cannot be palpated is not correct. You would say all of the, the neck is covered in the lower part, but thyroid cartilage is in that pathway. <coughs> Corpus test negative, no pulsing three lower the skull. I think that part is taken. And we move to the examination of the cervical lymph nodes. There is a node palpable in this case because I have admitted this patient in the posterior triangle. The palpable load. Posterior triangle? Level 5. What are the levels of the nodes in the